There's one thing to keep in mind, which is that blockchain technology is not the solution to all the problems under the sun. And I think as it matures, we will begin to see its uh, potential benefits, but also its limitations. I'm Alex Tapscott. I'm the CEO and founder of Northwest Passage Ventures, which is a venture capital firm making investments into companies in the blockchain industry. I'm also the co-author of the book, Blockchain Revolution, How the Technology Behind Bitcoin is Changing Money, Business, and the World. Started first with financial services and banking. Uh, and a lot of people actually mistake this technology as a, what's called a so-called fintech thing, um, which to be sure, it's going to have a big impact on financial services, but that's one of many different areas. Um, we've noticed it getting lots of attention in the world of technology, unsurprisingly, but also in things like manufacturing and supply chain management, uh, creative industries, where the question of digital rights management is a big one, and where blockchain technology and smart contracts could ensure that artists and other creators of content get paid fairly and get paid first. Uh, it's spread to government, where Perhaps we can finally fulfill the promise of 25 years ago to use technology to change the way that governments work, uh, not just how they deliver services and whether or not we can create efficiencies, but also changing the very nature of democracy itself. We've seen it spread to central banking, where the Bank of England, the People's Bank of China, the Bank of Canada, the Federal Reserve have all said that this technology could hold a lot of promise to make the financial system more resilient, more efficient, and more inclusive. And we've seen it, to me, um, this is one of the things that gives me great pleasure, um, really catching on in the developing world. The first generation of the internet helped to connect people, but it didn't actually help them to connect into the global economy. Uh, it gave them a way to access social media, but not a way to send money to create a savings account, to access a loan, to get an identity that they can use to gain access to services. And this technology holds that potential, but we're also seeing it play out. So in India and, and uh, the Philippines and South America and South Africa and, and, and elsewhere. So to me, the opportunity to bring unbanked people into the world and to um, finally fulfill the promise of technology as a um, you know, rising tide that lifts all boats is something that gives me a lot of uh, encouragement and makes me quite excited about the future. And there are lots of reasons why blockchain maybe not fail. I think we're past that point, but where it might not reach its potential. You know, is the technology ready for prime time? Can it really meet the demands of all of these different use cases that people think it could handle? Will government regulators move too quickly and create rules and laws that help to stifle innovation? Or will incumbents in say, you know, technology, insurance, financial services, see this technology as an existential threat and try to do everything they can to stop it. What are the implications for policy when technology removes intermediaries and where we have to rely on a new trust protocol to manage a lot of our affairs? What are the implications of criminals using this technology to move money around? to hijack computer systems, to pay ransomware, et cetera. So they're not without their challenges. You have to ask yourself, are these all reasons that blockchain's a bad idea? Or are they implementation challenges to be overcome? And I think in every single one of them, they're implementation challenges. You know, something like technology? Is it ready for prime time? Well, this is an open source revolution and it, sh it should stay an open source revolution to enable us to find solutions to help it scale. And already we're seeing lots of exciting developments. Will incumbents try and crush it? Well, actually, we've seen a lot of incumbents and a lot of governments take a fairly enlightened view of this. They don't want to have a repeat of the first generation of the internet where vested interests and leaders of the old paradigm fought against change and ultimately lost. So maybe this time they'll try and pursue it differently. I think the policy question remains uncertain and unanswered, but that's something we'll have to address. But in each of these cases, they're just challenges that we need to overcome. So the future is far from certain, but I'm optimistic. If you only focus on how to cut costs from your business, you may miss altogether 
what new businesses get created and what new opportunities get created. So we see a lot of examples of banks and consulting companies and other um, you know, big four audit firms talking about how they can strip cost out of the business of, I don't know, trading in public markets or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but if you take the example of public markets, how can you cut cost out of a market that doesn't exist in the future? What if the trading of securities happens peer-to-peer in the marketplace that doesn't have the traditional intermediaries of exchanges and brokers and agents and escrow agents and clearing houses and all these other parties that we rely on? That's the cost you're cutting out, but what if the market can function without them? So the important thing for big leaders of big companies is not just to think about cost, but also to think strategically. What can this technology enable me to do that I wasn't able to do in the past? If it's financial services, it could be how do I target the two and a half billion people in the world who don't have access to banking? What other markets could I get in others other than financial assets? Should I be you know, looking at the energy market, carbon trading, something else? How does this technology infuse the Internet of Things and what's the payment mechanism that will happen uh, to animate it and how can I play a role? You have to think about the future, not about your legacy businesses because your legacy businesses will change by definition. They're legacy businesses. What's critical is that it doesn't matter what industry you're in. You might think, oh, I make you know, lipstick. I'm a cosmetic manufacturer. What does blockchain have to do with me? Well, actually, it has a lot to do with you. Uh, if you're an airline, what does it have to do with me? Well, you have a complex supply chain. You have to deal with fuel. It's got a lot to do with you. Um, financial services, media, the arts. This is not something that's going to impact one or two industries. It's going to affect every industry in the same way that uh, you know, the internal combustion engine affected almost every industry, the same way the internet affected almost every industry, the way the steam engine created new industries. So this is one of those big generational technology shifts that will require a concerted and focused response. Otherwise, you'll miss the boat. The Internet of Things will probably be the best test case for a lot of blockchain technology. Because if we're going to have millions of, or billions or trillions of Internet-enabled devices doing everything from driving us around to managing our affairs to um, monitoring our health, they're going to need a way to move and store and manage value and data that has value in a way that's secure and private. And right now we don't have that. And I, I'm concerned about the ubiquity of data and, and how it flows in and through internet connected devices, I think with a value platform like blockchain, we can at least address some of these problems and maybe even create new opportunities. Well, I, I try not to deal too much with hypotheticals like that. Um, I, yeah, look, there's a potential that this technology will create whole new models for how we create value and organize capability, especially with the concurrent rise of things like artificial intelligence. So if instead of Uber, you've got Suber, so a blockchain Uber, where a bunch of autonomous vehicles are using a di native digital currency to transact and enter into contracts with each other and with fares, they don't need to have a profit motive in the same way that a company does. They can operate at a marginal cost of basically 0% margin. So there's no more money being made. So what does that mean for all the people that those companies employ? Well, they're probably out of business if they have a competitor that can operate at 0% profit margin. The counterpoint to that is that our, our rides have all gone down by 20 or 30 or 50 or 70 or 90%, and we can get around for a dollar a day. So what kind of utility and value does that create in the economy? So who knows? I mean, there are Lots of positives and negatives. I think we're a long way off from a world of um, idle humanity, not having anything to do. Um, <laughs> if anything, past technology revolutions have told us to be humble in making that prediction. This has happened a lot in the past, you know, going all the way back to the invention of the automated loom and the Luddites in England in the early 1800s. So we're still going strong. And I think that the future will hold uh, lots of surprises for us, um, new business models, new ways of creating value, new ways of keeping people busy, and hopefully it's done in a way that's responsible. So we'll see. The future is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And there are a lot of people working in this industry to try and figure out how to use 
this technology for good, for bad, for whatever. Previous technology revolutions have created lots of value. They've also created lots of problems. And I think that invariably that will be the case here. But my hope, if I had one wish for blockchain, is that we can help to use this technology to address some of the specific problems that have been created during the first generation of the digital age, where we have rising wealth but not increasing prosperity, where as a result of entering into, um, you know, by using social media and other sites, we're entering into a Faustian bargain where we have to give up lots of our data and that can undermine our privacy, where the technology didn't have as big an impact on changing the nature of work and the nature of organizations and the nature of business models like financial services. So the future could be dark and stormy, it could be bright and sunny. Uh, it's up to those who are doing this to, to figure that out. I hope to play a, a small role as one of many, many stakeholders in seeing that uh, future come to light.